Hey guys, and welcome to another one of our Ghost Country podcasts. As always, I'm joined by my co-host over in Germany, Geist. Hey guys. Hey guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so today, we're going to be covering, well, two episodes in one, uh, Ezogashima and the Republic of Ezo. So I guess I'll open up with this one, but having lived in Japan for basically three years uh, and having visited Hokkaido, modern Ezogashima, I, I, this was a very interesting episode for me. I just, there was so much that I found interesting from the story of the Ainu and Ezo to what eventually happened during the Boshin War, which was very much Japan's own version of the American Civil War, the emergence of the Republic of Ezo, uh, the Meiji Restoration, and how that brought Japan into the new imperial era. I, I thought this was a fascinating episode, or two yeah. episodes. Yeah, I, I, I do also think so. I, there, was a, there were a lot of things that I learned in this episode, and also that we had some new animation True. techniques that we were using in this episode. I, I don't know if everybody noticed that, uh, but sometimes we have some improves, which like <laughs> for, the, for the watchers are like minor things, but for us, you know, we, we do that, and then we're like, wow, and like the whole rest of the day is like, oh, we made that work, we made that work. Oh, but, yeah. Um, no, 100%. Like, we had some of the, uh, like, the Battle of, uh, why am I blanking on this here? Uh, Miyako Bay. There we go. We had the, uh, you know, the ships moving in and out. We also had that during the Battle of Hakodate Bay. So I, I think it was cool. I, I felt proud that those looked, you know, halfway decent at least. Yeah, yeah, it was. And, and if I'm not mistaken, we also had, like, in the background battle noises. Yeah. And whole stuff. That was definitely, for me... This was a new era of uh, of our videos. Oh uh, no, I, that I, sounds like super epic, but <laughs> from the editing point of view, I think it really is. Oh no, but I agree with you. We began to do, you know, there were sound effects, there were little movements, um, animations, uh, green screen effects. This is where things began to. I, I agree, it was the start of a new era, kind of. <laughs> and okay, guys, so that's the end of the podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, but actually speaking about eras, we were talking about this before we started recording. Uh, when does Demon Slayer take place? Because we thought, um, or at least Geist thought, I should say, that it took place in the late 1800s. Don't blame it on me. <laughs> Don't blame it on me. <laughs> but at least according to what I can find online, Demon Slayer takes place in the Taisho era, which spanned from roughly 1912 to 1926, if I'm correct. So that's actually a little later than I thought. Yeah, for me, it's actually a lot later than I thought. I, yeah. I, I, I mean, I thought, to be honest, it would play like in the 90s of the 19th century or whatever, yeah. or, or even in the 80s, but that it's at 1912, that was kind of surprising for me. Yeah, no, same. Uh, Definitely. Even though, I mean, <clears throat> I just watched the first season. I didn't watch season two yet. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, for me, it actually felt like that. But uh, I was already discussing with Ghost, and we came to the conclusion, no, the authors are wrong. We are right. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's our, story, our version of the story. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, okay, so moving into the episode itself, I think let's start out with Hokkaido, or Ezo, Ezo Kashima. What I think is actually very interesting here is that despite... Hokkaido definitely being an integral part of what is now Japan today. I mean, I think most Japanese people could not think of Japan without Hokkaido being part of it. Um, back, you know, for a significant period of time throughout history, Hokkaido was the northern frontier. It was the periphery of what was, you know, eventually Japan. I mean, e even going into the era when, you know, Hokkaido was being um, incorporated into Japan, you still had the indigenous Ainu people, you had the Russians trying to push themselves in. And I mean, if we stretch back even further, you know, even northern Honshu, you had like the Amishi and other, um, you know, ethnic groups on the island. So it was, it's interesting to see what I'm trying to say is it was not so black and white. There were definitely shades of gray. And this was a process over time that slowly saw Ezogashima, Hokkaido become integrated into what is now known as Japan. Yeah, I, I ask myself um, if a reason why this is nowadays accepted as, an, as a real part of Japan, even though it's not for uh, such a long time, 
And there goes my iPad again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the what was following basically Imperial Japan mm. and uh, like, uh, I don't know how to call it, like the rise of the nationalism and stuff. Mm. Uh, that's why I kind of got forgotten. Mm. Um, or if the people really identify themselves. With, I mean, that's a, I mean, both go in, uh, go in uh, same ways. Probably those people there identified themselves more than with Japan and the rest of Japan kind of forgot that mm-hmm. there was something. Like, I don't want to say forgot, but it was kind of like uh, not as in, uh, important as many other things, for example. Well, so I, I think it was pre- probably the rise of nationalism and education. That definitely, but there also was the consolidation because remember, part of the reason, and I don't want to skip ahead to this, but part of the reason why those who were behind the Republic of Ezo did what they did, including probably first and foremost, Enamoto Takeake, was they wanted to bring Ezo fully into Japanese orbit. And they felt they could do this by, you know, protecting some members of the Tokugawa clan, having their own little, like, not a breakaway state because they really didn't want to leave, but, you know, this little, I don't know what you want to call it, but like guarded community where the previous system could in some way still remain, even with the Meiji restoration and modernization. But a big motivation behind what they did was to bring Ezo fully into Japanese orbit. Um, They they wanted to bring it in. They didn't want the Russians to have any claims on it. Yeah, so in a weird way, this was like a move to draw it closer into that orbit. And I feel like I uh, repeated myself multiple times here, but yeah. It was bringing it into the socio-political entity of Japan. Yeah, so that's definitely and very interesting. And no, I just want to point out this process was not clear-cut. As we noted in the Ezogashima episode, it was over decades and centuries that you had the so-called Wajin, the Japanese, slowly begin to move into Ezogashima. And you had like the various, you know, the island was more or less split between Wajinshi and uh, Ezochi, if I'm correct with that. My names may be wrong there, but basically between a part where you had, you know, the Ainu and the Japanese. And slowly over time, for a whole host of factors, the Ainu population uh, began to decline and the Japanese population began to go up uh, until you had a point where the Japanese were the uh, majority on Ezogashima or uh, Hokkaido. And in a way, I think there can be parallels drawn with this process to that of like, you know, conquering the West in the United States with like manifest destiny and, the, you know, bringing it in to America's orbit. It's there's a similar process and you could look at other examples throughout uh, world history as well. But it's very much bringing something that was peripheral into the core. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't have a lot of, a lot of knowledge from uh, that part of time and the and the geography behind that so yeah i mean the things that you just explained and also the whole episode i think were very very interesting also with the things coming that we yeah, talked a little bit about that basically but um also one thing that i really liked about this episode was it it was on a longer time period i mean it's two true. episodes we did true true um but it was basically going through the whole history and um, it's with, with a lot of places. And actually, we could have also done a ghost geography basically about this. Oh, definitely. Um, but uh, yeah, the Republic of Ezo was like uh, our returning point to Minami Toroshima and also with a lot of people that we had in Minami Toroshima, which uh, appeared also in the Republic of Ezo. Yeah, no, that's true. We did have a little bit of this like thematic universe going on because uh, <laughs> Enamoto was one of the main officials who uh, received uh, Mizut- Mizutani Shinroku in uh, Tokyo when he made it, or was it Tokyo at that point? I think it was. I- I'm getting my names confused of whether it was Tokyo <laughs> or Edo, but timelines are going crazy. But he received him when he made it back from Minami Torishima after, you know, they had gotten to the island and gotten shipwrecked and they had to try to find their way back and they missed a bunch of the other islands the, and they ended up coming all the way back to Japan and the mainland. So uh, 
it's interesting to see that those two had a very loose, but nonetheless, uh, a historical connection. And without giving things away, some future episodes we're going to be doing about Imperial Japan. Actually, there are other players who were involved in events such as the Battle of Hakodate and uh, stuff like that. So we definitely have kind of this Imperial Japanese connected universe going on on the channel. <laughs> we will also have other oh, Japan I'm sure. for sure in there. Yeah, yeah, Japan and other countries as well, I'm sure, in time. Yeah, maybe one day we will episodes we do episodes about other places. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, overall, um, I really do like the episode as because I explained like I I didn't know a lot and uh, also the new editing style uh, it made it look more fresh to mm. me and I th I think it's just the perfect ghost country Rep republic of Ezo also because it was just existing for a very short time actually true uh, what was it like four months. Yeah, it, or something like this, where it was really officially existing. It was established, if I'm correct, in like January 27, uh, 1869, and it was gone by June 27 of the same year. So, yeah, pretty short period of time, like what five months. Um, yeah. Now, I do want to say, let, let's give a bit of context here. So, the Tokugawa shogunate was the ruling, you know, entity of Japan up until this period of time, and w so. You know, we've talked about uh, Ezogashima. I mean, there's plenty more we could go into, obviously, about how the Japanese came to eventually bring it into their orbit. But I think what's important to go on to next is how the Republic of Ezo came into being. And the seminal event for that was the Boshin War, which was essentially, like I said, Japan's version of the American Civil War. And this was fought from 1868 to 1869. So, yeah. Uh, but this was a very interesting event for me, and I know we noted this in the episode itself, because this really was a clash between traditionalism and modernity. The Meiji Restoration, which would bring back the emperor, also was embracing of modernization, while the Tokugawa Shogunate was modernizing, but it was doing it at a much more restrained pace. And you had the clash of these two. Uh, these two uh, competing paths for Japan going into the uh, uh, 20th century. And I think that's just fascinating because, you know, when you see movies like uh, The Last Samurai, that's basically what this was in a sense. I mean, I know the movie is based on other historical events, but I, this is really what this was. This was a clash between modernity and tradition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I always have to think about that movie as well when I see that episode. Um... Even though there were little well, minor things, in my opinion, which didn't make that much sense. Sure. But uh, I think it just looked at it as a of a neutral perspective. I think it's an entertaining movie, movie, uh, which is also caused by, as you explained, the clash between modernity and uh, traditions, basically. Yeah. Yeah, and also the fact that the Ainu were very long beards. <laughs> <laughs> that is something in so stark contrast to. <laughs> Japanese nowadays. Well, and also, so it's the, actually funny. Yeah. Like the clothing, the tattoos, the facial tattoos, especially with women. I mean, uh, yeah. it, it was a very different culture. And to be fair, Ainu culture does remain. You it, mean because it, they still kill bears? Uh, oh, the uh, I'm blanking on the name <laughs> of the bear ceremony now. But I mean, yeah, I forgot. That. But uh, yeah, no, it, it's it's interesting. Um, and I feel like I'm going off, to, uh, bouncing back and forth here, but like. I do want to say again, the Tokugawa Shogunate was not completely opposed to modernization. Yes, they did close the country off. Yes, they did enact a lot of policies that were there to preserve the status quo. But they were doing their own things to modernize, especially the military in Japan. So like there was the uh, French military mission to Japan from 1867 to 1868. And it's pretty interesting. These uh, French military officers sent there were, you know, sent to modernize the Japanese military um, and the Navy. And one of those individuals, Jules Brunet, would play a seminal role in the Republic of Ezo. But so it, what I'm trying to say is there was it, it's not literally like one side was not modernizing, but one side was definitely pushing for this at a much quicker pace. And it's still just interesting to see how figures involved in this would eventually work their way back to the Republic of Ezo. Yeah, that's definitely. Um, but 
Uh, I'll just come in and say this, but despite these efforts at modernization, the Shogunate was uh, rather unexpectedly defeated at the Battle of Tobu, uh, Toba, excuse me, Fushimi, in January 1868. And despite this being basically the opening battle of the Boshin War, it pretty much was all downhill from there for uh, the Shogunate. And it wasn't that long until, you know, the forces of the, the imperial forces, I guess you could say, of the uh, Meiji Restoration were walking into Edo and there was that final fight at the Battle of Ueno. And then after that, those few remaining loyalists of the Tokugawa Shogunate, including Enomoto, began to work their way up north to Ezogashima. So what I'm just... It's interesting to me because the Republic of Ezo is definitely tied in integrally uh, <laughs> uh, without any question to the civil war then ongoing in Japan, the Boshin War. But like, what, what about like your uh, personal interest? I mean, like, did, were you interested in this time period of Japan before? Or was it like something where you just found by accident and were like, oh, okay. Uh, or is it like your, your interests are somewhere else? I mean, I think it's an interesting time period, uh, not just in Japan, but all over the world. But I think for me specifically with Japan, why it's interesting is this, like I said, this really was the end of an era and the beginning of a new one, that of Imperial Japan. And again, coming from an American perspective here, seeing all the connections or similarities, I should say, with the American Civil War. Um, and to be fair, I'm not saying they are equivalent in any sense of the way the causes or what was going on, but still there were some general themes. And in fact, there are some really weird connections like uh, the Japanese ironclad uh, Kotetsu, uh, which we mentioned was involved um, in a series of battles during the Boshin War and was a very important ship that actually was produced for the Confederacy. And it was originally named um, Stonewall. But because the Civil War ended in America, it eventually fell into American hands in 1865, if I'm correct, and then was bought by the Shogunate. But by the time it arrived there, the Boshin War was in play. The Americans didn't want to get involved. Eventually, it was handed over to the new imperial government. So it's just, it's really weird to see all these, you know, connecting the dots from historical events all over the world. But besides that, I mean, I think it's just a very interesting period of time. It's... It, there's, you know, Japan had much more, like I said, even though Ezogashima was still not fully in Japanese orbit, you, there were, there is more Japanese influence in that part of the world and other parts of the world. And this would continue under the, you know, under Imperial Japan. So it's just a fascinating period of time in my perspective, because it was when Japan was very much expanding in the region and responding to Western actions in the Asia Pacific colonization, uh, events occurring in China, this, in many ways, was a reaction to it in part as well. Yeah, I mean, if you if you look at it, our episode about um, the Taiping Rebellion, that was more or less in the same time setting as well. Yeah. It was a little later, but not, not, not much later. Yeah. Oh, no, exactly. So, yeah, there was definitely also a reaction. Um, yeah. Um, well, and just mentioning the Kotetsu again... Um, the Battle of Miyako Bay, which we did have animation for, that was just like, this is an event I knew nothing about. And it was just fascinating to me that forces from the Republic of Ezo tried to pull off a false flag operation. I mean, they were flying under the American flag and they were trying to sneak into Miyako Bay, steal the ironclad, maybe, and, you know, kind of delay the invasion by Imperial forces uh, of Ezo. And this didn't really go well, but it, it's just crazy. You had, you know, samurai with katanas coming over, uh, boarding other ships. You had the imperial forces using a gadling gun, b fighting off the people. Then the forces of the Republic of Ezo retreating. That one ship that unfortunately was delayed coming in at the wrong moment and being scuttled. Um, and it's uh, uh, those on, you know, on board were captured. But it was just, this is a incident in a bigger historical event that I knew nothing about. And for me, it's also interesting. I just thought about this. I'm not 100% sure of that. But the reason why it actually the, that 
could have worked that false flag operation mm. was actually because most of the modern ships were kind of looking similar because they were not traditional Chinese ships, but like uh, from the West. Oh, yeah. And that's why it could have worked because in former times they wouldn't have worked. Like, because the difference between Japanese ships and American ships was very obvious. Yeah. So, yeah, that was also an interesting part of why it could have worked, actually. Well, and just on that note, something I found interesting while doing research for this episode and future episodes dealing with Imperial Japan um, is just like you mentioned, the sheer amount of ships that were being purchased from the West, whether that be Europe or America, a lot of these ships were being produced in shipyards, again, over in Europe or America, and being purchased and transported all the way back to Japan. And it's just a bit of yeah. history that, I don't know, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, but also I will, because oh, a lot on. of people don't know. Yeah, no, no, exactly, exactly. And um, I will say, despite the importance of the naval component, the naval battle of Hakodate did not really go well for the Republic of Ezo, and things collapsed very quickly thereafter. Um, I think they only sunk one ship, which was... Uh, not so good, considering that the Imperial side sunk, like, what was it? Maybe, uh, I think they sunk two and captured three. So it, it definitely did not go in their favor. Yeah, so uh, the whole sh factor with the ships, actually, for me, is also a um, pretty interesting story. But, I mean, it's not only this, also the weapons and all, kind of, all kinds of things. So it was a really quickly changing uh society and everything well and again to um, that point yeah. at the battle of hakodate you had you know samurai or at least elite troops from the former tokugawa shogunate facing off against much more modern uh forces yeah. from you know the imperial government yeah like in the last summer yeah exactly <laughs> i mean again it all goes back to that and that movie was not really just talking about you know i mean it did kind of was generally talking about the uh, Boshin War, but also the Satsuma Rebellion and stuff like that. So, yeah, it, it's not really talking about the Republic of Ezo, but there's just so many parallels that, you know, kind of you have to talk about it, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's like the major restoration would definitely be also something which we could talk about in one of our episodes. Oh, definitely. Um, because I think there were just very few instances in history where a society was like ch changing this drastically mm -hmm. within sh within sh such a short uh, time because of course we got stories like for example the economic miracle from germany in the 1950s 60s whatever but that's not comparable because the technologies were more or less already there it's just like the people got richer mm -hmm. then you also got china where it was similar like in germany uh for a longer time period but in japan it was really like Oh yeah, this was uh, a... like from a very traditional mindset to a yeah hyper capitalism basically. Yeah, no, this um, was a condensed period of like you said hyper modernization because we're not just talking about the military, but like you were mentioning, it was economic, it was uh, you know society like electrification, introduction of you know rail cars and new technologies. It was almost like day and night in a very short period of time. And this was very much a purposeful policy done by the Japanese to, well, survive and theoretically thrive after seeing what was going on elsewhere in Asia. I mean, it was a reaction to what was going on. Yeah, yeah. It was basically the beginning of Imperial Japan. Yeah. Um, oh, no, definitely. And I'm trying to remember, but I think it was when, you know, Commodore Matthew Perry arrived with the Great White Fleet in Japan and basically forced them to open up. There were reports talking about, you know, how when they were arriving, you know, you were seeing people that were, I don't want to say like feudal, but in a sense, like almost in like medieval armor and weaponry. And this discrepancy was noted not by just the Westerners, but also by the Japanese. And this was, again, one of those big factors that pushed not just the Meiji, uh, you know, uh, uh, with the Meiji Restoration, I mean, this was not only, you know, their reason to modernize, but you saw this with the Tokugawa Shogunate as well. There was a realization in Japan that they had to catch up, basically, if they didn't want to have a similar fate to other parts of Asia. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it was kind of not really voluntary, but it was kind of like, 
I mean, it was volume. I, I, I think you get what I'm talking about. It, it wasn't, it wasn't in a sense because it was occurring, but, you know, the Meiji revolution or restoration kind of speaks to a, a push that, you know, the Tokugawa Shogun it maybe didn't want to go at that fast a pace. Yeah. And to be sure, there yeah. were conservative elements in society that didn't want certain things to occur because the restoration really did put traditional Japanese society, you know, it topsy turvy, it turned it upside down, basically. So, yeah, definitely a very interesting factor, this whole yeah. change. Um, and what's also interesting is a lot of the people involved in this period of time and with the Republic of Ezo, their story didn't end there. I mean, they played roles later on in Imperial Japan, as we mentioned with uh, Minami Torishima. I mean, that's a very minor like chance encounter, but there were roles, like we mentioned in episode, a lot of these seminal figures, they didn't just go into the distance, the sunset, and were never seen again. No, they still remained active. And actually, uh, with Enomoto again, he really crafted or at least gave support to a lot of expansionist policy um, of Imperial Japan. Yeah. So, um, so was there any particular moment of this whole uh, episode, which you didn't mention in the episode where you thought, like, I, I could have talked about this more or wanted? Ah, uh, that's making me think back a little bit now. Um, off the top of my head, no, but I'm sure there is something I'm forgetting. I mean, it was an interesting event. Something I wish I could have found more information about. I, I will admit when we were doing this is going back to when the Japanese were first beginning to push into Ezogashima. I wish I could have found more information about like Shakushane's rebellion and the various uprisings by the uh, Ainu peoples, because like there was information, but it was hard to come by, and there was contradictory information, and some of it was you know maybe more verifiable than others. But it's like I, I wish there was more detailed information about that period of time, and maybe there is, and I just wasn't coming across it during my research. But I, I would like to know more about that period of time. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, how about uh, you? Also, I, also I think. <laughs> the name Shaku Shane is really like it sounds like um I don't know how to describe it, like a like a villain from Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the more I looked into him, it was I mean, again, details are kind of hard to verify, but supposedly he was a giant of a man and you know how he united the various Ainu groups. I mean, there was obviously stuff as we mentioned in episode, there was uh various well, kind of similar to uh you know, the German Confederation, there were, the Ainu were not like a united entity. There were different groups and some of these groups were hostile and friendly with each other, but this morphed into a big anti, you know, Wajin, anti, well, it wasn't just the Wajin, it was, uh, you know, the groups that were controlling Ezo at the time. But still, it was, uh, you know, rebellion against them, but it was a very interesting uh, period of history that I do wish I could look into a little bit more, and maybe we will in a future episode. I mean, we detail it here, but there's no reason we can't go into events in further detail at some point. Yeah, I mean, like, one, one thing which for me was very interesting was when we were talking about uh, traditions mm. um, from the, the Aino people, mm. like, for example, what you mentioned with the bears. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of, I think that's what it was called. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I don't remember really the the name of the, those traditions, um, but it definitely was a story. Where I was like, hmm, kind of would like to read a book about that. Um, well, and also on that note, seeing the fluidity between those peoples in that part of, I guess you could say, North Asia. I mean, how you had the Oketz, um and the Ainu and the Proto Ainu and you know, Satsumon and all these different peoples. And uh, the Nivik, and you can still see the Nivik, you know, culture in like uh, Sahelin and parts of North Asia. And it's just interesting to see all this movement, not to mention that conflict with the, uh, uh, the Mongols <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and the Ainu. It's like, I knew nothing about that. Yeah. I mean, as I said before, I, <laughs> I knew very little. So, of course, I didn't either. Yeah. So it was a really interesting bit of history. And it does tie into the modern. I mean, the story of Hokkaido is not very, well, it's not done. I mean, something we could easily cover in a ghost geography episode is the disputed northern territories of Japan. 
because as I'm sure you've seen in the maps we had um, for the Republic of Ezo, at that time, Japan did control some of the Kuro or Chishima Islands, which are now controlled by Russia post-World War II, but are still claimed by Japan. And this is an ongoing territorial dispute. So that's, uh, you know, that's something we may talk about in the future, I think. Yeah, totally, totally doable, as, as a lot of things are. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. Any, any closing words on this episode? I feel like I talked a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it was one of my favorite episodes. No, so I, 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 I will just repeat. <laughs> yeah, no, it was. I got nothing to add. For me, it was a fascinating episode or episodes. Yeah. Um, and uh, I liked the time setting. I liked uh, the geographic area and stuff. And I think it's always like when you don't know things. They, at least for me, in a historical setting, they always appear more interesting than other things. Yeah, no, I would agree. I also will say on a completely random note, talking about modern Hokkaido, um, some of the best cheesecake I've had anywhere in the world is there. And also, I don't know how familiar you are with like mascots in Japan, like different prefectures, um, businesses, government entities, even prisons <laughs> sometimes have their own mascot. And uh, the mascot for, I'm forgetting if he's for Sapporo or Hokkaido in general, but uh, Melonkuma, it's like a bear with a melon on its head. Um, it, it's an interesting mascot. I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting mascot. That's, that's so Japan. <laughs> it, it's, it's interesting. I definitely picked up some merchandise when I was in Sapporo for uh, Melonkuma. But yeah, I'll, you'll see him in this video, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, I think... Then we are done for today. Yeah. No, I um, hope you guys enjoyed this uh, podcast. If you haven't checked out either of those two episodes, there should be cards somewhere in this video. Also, there will be links down in the description. Let us know if there's anything else Japan related or more generally in Asia you'd like to see covered. Just comment down below. And yeah, I think that about does it. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, see you guys next week. <laughs> yeah, see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.